So uh, obviously 1879 is uh, Trotsky's birth year, and 1905, which we've covered in some detail, is the first Russian Revolution, uh, the dress rehearsal for 1917. 1917 is, of course, the year of the Russian Revolution. Um, and last week, uh, Richard covered a sort of broad period uh, from 1917 up until 1928. And so he went off the original periodization scheme a little bit. Um, but the uh, significance of 1923 then um, would be that this is the year that Lenin is really um, out of action politically. And so the beginning of the question of Trotskyism. So for the dates that we're dealing with today, 1923 to 1933, really the issue is the question of Trotskyism. Um, Richard already addressed some of this last week, and what I'd like to do is uh, go over um, some of the issues there and address them with respect to the later history uh, towards the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s. Um, so the question of Trotskyism uh, is a little bit of a vexed one, um, because from the mainstream communist movement perspective, uh, Trotskyism is, um, well, it's a variety of things, but one of the things that it can be accused of is a kind of left sectarianism. And certainly subsequent history, not only in Trotsky's lifetime, but uh, especially after Trotsky's death in 1940, tends to confirm um, this apprehension of Trotskyism as a kind of left sectarianism. Uh, the fragmentation of Trotskyism itself um, seems to prove that, um, and it's an ongoing uh, process of, of fragmentation that Trotskyism has experienced. So what I'd like to address is the question of the relationship between Trotskyism and the left opposition as it emerged in the 1920s. And Richard talked about that last week a bit um, with respect to uh, the history from 1917 to 1928, from Trotsky's joining the Bolshevik party and participating in the October Revolution, alongside Lenin, uh, to his being exiled in 1928. Treating that history of Lenin as a Bolshevik and then as a dissident Bolshevik, um, we're going to broaden the question of the left opposition today to include the international scene. And so really the question of the international left opposition, the left opposition in the third international. And that's the significance of 1923 to 1933 is the emergence of Trotskyism, but in the context of the emergence of the left opposition, and specifically the international left opposition. Now, the, uh, the end date for the period that we are going to be addressing today is, of course, um, the victory of Nazism in Germany. And really, it's that victory that convinces Trotsky that it's no longer a matter of a left opposition of the Third International, but rather um, the need to found a new international, the Fourth International, which they do in 1938. But the need for that is already established in 1933 by virtue of the failure of the uh, Third International to prevent the victory of Nazism. Um, it's at that moment, I should also add, that uh, the decision to um, break with the Third International, and one of the readings that we had for today in terms of the readings on uh, the rise of fascism and the destruction of the workers' movement in Germany, um, is um, to build communist parties and an international anew, um, which is from uh, this time, from the crisis of the, uh, of the victory of Nazism. And um, in that, Trotsky addresses the issue of how to regard the history of Marxism in terms of one of failure, meaning the failure of the Second International, and then for him in 1933, the failure of the Third International. The significance of this in the 1930s, which will be the next period that we deal with, 1933 to 1940, next week, um, is that for Trotsky, the political significance of the Third International um, becomes uh, indistinguishable from that of the Second International. In other words, from 1933 to 1940, Trotsky's attitude is that both the rump, the remaining Socialist International, the Second International, Social Democracy, and Stalinism have been uh, exposed as being um, non-revolutionary, reformist, perhaps even counter-revolutionary. 
Um, so in this respect, uh, there's a fundamental shift between the period 1923 to 33 and 1933 to 40, in that originally in the period of the international left opposition, all the way up to and including Trotsky's first period of exile up to the Nazi victory in 1933, Trotsky's orientation was to split the Third International, to split the revolutionary elements away from the reformist and the centrist elements. And what we have then in the readings that we did for today in Where is Britain Going, Problems of the Chinese Revolution, and the writings um, leading up to and in the aftermath of the Nazi victory in Germany, um, is the question of the political failure of the Third International as it's unfolding in the 1920s, uh, in specifically in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, so that failure, Trotsky's orientation towards that failure initially, was to try to recover um, the initial impulse of the Third International to save the Third International from itself after this period, that's no longer the case. After this period, it's really a question of the Fourth International. Okay, so um, what are we dealing with then in terms of the period 1923 to 1933? Why is 1923 significant? I mentioned earlier that um, this is the period of Lenin's um, really the sort of final convalescence and it's really out of commission politically, not really able to participate <coughs> politically um, after 1923. That's one significance. The other significance, of course, is that this is, at the time, is considered the definitive end of the revolutionary period with the final failure of revolutionary politics in Germany in 1923. So I think that Richard mentioned last time that there was uh, some talk of sending either Zinoviev or Trotsky to Germany to lead the German revolution in 1923. Um, in other words, there was an acknowledged uh, lack of revolutionary leadership in the German party in Germany at that time that they thought could be um, rectified by the participation of either Zinoviev or Trotsky. Um, now, sort of a curious estimation. So why is that the case? We might consider 1923 to be um, definitive in a certain respect but perhaps less definitive than the failure of the German Revolution in 1919 and the murder of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, as well as um, uh, their collaborators in the Spartacus Bund and the German Communist Party in 1919. Meaning that could be considered the definitive end of the German revolutionary cycle if what's understood, which was widely understood at the time in the Third International uh, up to 1923, that there was a lack of adequate revolutionary leadership with respect to the German Revolution. Meaning it's a question of the Third International's ability to be, uh, to provide the political leadership for international revolution. That's the question that's concerning Trotsky in the period after 1923 as well. In other words, in where is Britain going, problems of the Chinese Revolution, and then finally, um, with the victory of Nazism in Germany in 1933. The question is that of the political leadership and the revolutionary political leadership of the Third International, whether um, that was the case or not. So addressing this then, uh, one of the issues that came up last week, um, at least in part in Richard's lecture, um, was the relationship of uh, Lenin and Trotsky. Now the question is shifting um, after Lenin is out of action and certainly after his death in 1924. There's the question of the legacy of Leninism. In other words, there's the struggle over the legacy of Lenin uh, between Trotsky and the leadership of not only the Russian Communist Party, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, but also in the Third International more generally. Right? So the issue is um, how can Trotsky claim the mantle of Lenin in this period? Uh, we had a little bit of that already indicated um, in the Lessons of October, the reading for last week, uh, meaning that that book is an intervention on Trotsky's part um, to claim the mantle of Lenin against the triumvirate uh, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Stalin. Uh, 
Now, one of the things that, that Richard addressed last week was the question of the various oppositional currents in the Russian Communist Party, but also, more broadly, in the Third International throughout the 1920s. So there's the question of the left opposition, but there's also the question of the right opposition. So last week, uh, Richard raised the issue of what if Trotsky, the left opposition, had allied with Bukharin, the right opposition, against what they perceived to be the center, Stalin, in the 1920s? Could Stalinism have been averted that way? Now this question is not merely one of the Russian Communist Party, but it's rather one of the Third International more generally. Right? So it's a broad question. There's an international right opposition as well as an international left opposition. And of course, there's the international center, namely there's the Stalinization of the Third International in the 1920s. So in this respect, um, the claim has to be on Trotsky's part um, that he represents uh, revolutionary continuity with Lenin with the Bolshevism of the October Revolution in 1917. Also, with, for example, um, Rosa Luxemburg in 1919 in Germany. Right, so the question is, um, in what way can Trotsky lay claim to uh, revolutionary continuity in the Third International? Now, the term that is going to be at issue then uh, this week is centrism. And centrism is a tricky term. So there's you know, the claim to be revolutionary. There's the accusation against one's opponents of reformism. But then there's also this category of centrism. Centrism, uh, the meaning of this term centrism, it's not what we deal with in terms of uh, third way politics, like when we talk about you know, Clinton as a centrist or Obama as a centrist, this kind of idea, it doesn't mean that. Right? What we're talking about is something very specific with respect to the history of Marxism, and that's centrism, meaning that it's people who claim to be revolutionary but are in fact reformist. Right? Reformists don't claim to be revolutionary. Right? They claim to be anti-revolutionary. So with centrists, the issue is those who claim to be revolutionary but are actually reformists. Um, and a little tricky thought figure is introduced with this concept of centrism, namely the subjective and the objective. Right? That people are subjectively, if they're accused of being centrism by ostensible revolutionaries, they're subjectively revolutionary, but they objectively um, fill a counter-revolutionary or a reformist role. Right, so this is the charge that Trotsky is making against Stalinism in the period of the 1920s. Namely, that the Stalinist center, but meaning center in a completely different sense, Stalin and the leadership of the Third International, Trotsky is saying that they are centrist, that they claim to be revolutionary, but in fact they're reformist and counter-revolutionary. The charge against Stalinism after 1933 is going to be different. The charge against Stalinism after 1933 is that Stalinism is reformist. All right, so in the 1920s, the charge against Stalinism is that it's centrist, that it claims to be revolutionary, but is in fact reformist. In the 1930s, Trotsky's accusation against Stalinism is going to be different. It's going to be that um, Stalinists, especially in the Popular Front period, are avowed reformists, hostile to revolutionary politics, counter-revolutionary. And that's going to be the characterization of Stalinism henceforth meaning the Fourth International Project of the 1930s is continued in subsequent history after Trotsky's death by Trotskyism. And Trotskyism will henceforth, from 1933 onward, claim that Stalinism is reformist. The accusation in the 20s, however, is that it's centrist, which is different, and actually raises all sorts of issues. In other words, it raises the issue of how can one claim 
to know that an ostensibly revolutionary politics is actually reformist and counter-revolutionary? How can you make the claim that they are subjectively revolutionary but are objectively counter-revolutionary? That's where the readings for today become important because in fact, um, the behavior, the attitude, and also the self-understanding of the Third International with respect to um, the crisis in Britain in 1926, the Chinese Revolution starting in 1927-28, and ultimately the politics of the third period, which is going to be a little bit trickier for us to handle, but we'll talk about it uh, towards the end of, of my talk here. The third period, 1928 to 1933, leading into the Nazi, the ultimate victory of the Nazis in 1933, the claim that um, Trotsky is making is that the Third International is objectively playing a counter-revolutionary role. So then, what is the point of the left opposition? What's the point of the international left opposition in the Third International? The point of the left opposition is to break the Third International from objectively counter-revolutionary politics on the basis of its claim to be revolutionary. In other words, it's an appeal to people who want to be revolutionary, but who are objectively playing a counter-revolutionary role. Right? That's uh, the nature of Trotsky's politics in this period, in the period of the 1920s. And so he has to make the case about the various maneuvers on the part of the Stalinized Third International, that what they have in common, and this is a term that I think that Richard uh, raised last week, but we'll talk about today, the zigzags of the 1920s. In other words, they're zigzagging on the part of Stalinism. Um, that, the, that Stalinists oscillate uh, from one position to another. But for Trotsky, what they have in common, what all the zigging and zagging has in common, is that there's an objective counter-revolutionary role being played by the Stalinized Third International. And that, that plays out not only, and perhaps even not so much, in the domestic politics of the Soviet Union in the 1920s, but really in terms of these potentially, what he considers to be potentially revolutionary crises globally in the 1920s. Now I mentioned the third period. So what was the second period? What was the first period? The first period is of course 1917 to 1923, namely the period in which um, revolution is possible. The second period is the period from 1923 to 1928 in which there's a stabilization of the international situation. There's an ebbing of revolutionary possibilities. And I should just say that the self-understanding that I'm articulating here is that of mainstream third internationalism. There's a way in which already, as we know from readings that we do in the academic year reading group, that for Lenin, for instance, in left-wing communism and infantile disorder in 1920, it's already the case after 1919 that the revolutionary situation is ebbing. Right. So he writes about the necessity of an orderly retreat as early as 1920, but then again in notes of a publicist uh, that he writes in 1922. Namely, in 1920 as well as in 1922, Lenin is characterizing the situation after the failure of the German Revolution in 1919 as one of the ebbing of revolutionary possibilities globally. So the way this is dated is interesting. In other words, do we date it from 1919? Do we date it from 1923? When did the situation start to stabilize? When did revolutionary possibilities start to ebb politically? Um, this is important um, with respect to something that Richard raised last week that I want to follow up on a little bit. Namely, the basis of um, Trotsky and Lenin's uh, collaboration in the period of Lenin's um, health problems and convalescence, really from um, 1921, 22, 23, 
what's the basis for Lenin reaching out to Trotsky and trying to make an alliance with him politically against the emergence of Stalin, the Stalinist center, and the triumvirate um, that starts to come together to um, head off Trotsky, namely Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Stalin, um, even before Lenin's death, right, in the years before Lenin's death. Like, what's the significance then? Um, in what way uh, was, was Lenin reaching out to Trotsky? I think that um, the question Richard raised last week was the Stalinist accusation of Trotskyism. In what way is the Stalinist accusation of Trotskyism um, already incipient, is already emerging politically in the period before Lenin's death? In other words, in what way are the Stalinists posing a distinction between Lenin and Trotsky in this period? Now, what we could say is that Trotsky himself, and I want to just uh, touch on certain things that um, were on our agenda last week, Trotsky himself could be perceived as having an ultra-left position in certain key moments, mean, meaning his disagreements with Lenin from 1917 to 1920. Um, around the Brest Treaty, the treaty, the peace treaty with Germany in 1918, um, Lenin wanted to uh, sign the treaty, put an end to hostilities with Germany, get breathing room, um, Trotsky wanted to um, extend the negotiations with the Germans as much as possible and in hopes that it would exacerbate the revolutionary situation in Germany. Um, and so in, in that respect, Trotsky might be said to have had a more optimistic view on the possibility of revolution in 1918 in Germany than Lenin did. Lenin said, no, revolution's not really happening in Germany at that moment. So we need to sign a peace treaty as quickly as possible with the Germans. Whereas Trotsky says, well, no, let's not come to any agreement with them. Um, let's rather hold off on that, extend the negotiations, continue to propagandize among the German troops in the hopes that there would be a revolution in Germany. Interestingly, Rosa Luxemburg also has this position. In other words, um, the cr criticism that Rosa Luxemburg makes of Lenin in 1918 in the Russian tragedy uh, not the pamphlet, The Russian Revolution, that she withheld from publication, but rather in the article that she did publish, The Russian Tragedy, her main accusation against the Bolsheviks is that they are aligning themselves with the Germans. And that in making peace with Germany, they were um, potentially endangering the revolution, both in Russia and in Germany. Right? So in that respect, Luxembourg and Trotsky have a similar position in 1918. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Lenin. It's one of the reasons why later um, the Stalinists will be able to amalgamize, sort of combine Luxembourg and Trotsky into a kind of ultra leftism, right? So that Trotsky is, uh, has an affinity with Luxembourg, and Luxembourg can be shown to have an affinity with Trotskyism. Um, and in the 1920s, uh, a great deal is made of this. So in the period after 1923, all the way up to 1928, to the moment of Trotsky's exile, the charge that the Stalinists make against Trotsky is that he's an ultra-leftist. He's an ultra-leftist, an adventurist, and therefore uh, dangerous. And um, again, there would be something of a charge like this, that uh, Trotsky's position might be subjectively revolutionary, but is objectively counter-revolutionary. Right. And so uh, this is where you get the charge against Trotskyism, the Trotskyite fascist wreckers, right? And it sort of spans the 20s into the 30s, that, that charge, the charge of ultra-leftism. Um, and it's a charge that's complicated by the third period, Stalinism of 1928 to 1933, um, that we'll talk about in a moment. But in this period, period from 1923 to 1928, sort of first, half of the period that we'll have in consideration today. Right, the charge against Trotsky is that um, he's a sort of an ultra-left, kind of a left adventurist, but still not authentically revolutionary. Right? 
um, meaning authentic revolutionary politics is still claimed by the Stalinist center, still by mainstream third internationalism. Now, of course, the international left opposition in characterizing itself as a left opposition, what they're claiming is that revolutionary possibilities in this period from 1923 to 1928 are greater than the leadership of the Third International thinks. Right, so where the leadership of the Third International is arguing for a more cautious, a more conservative approach with respect to politics, Trotsky is saying, no, real revolutionary possibilities are being squandered in this period. And so what we know from the readings for today, those revolutionary possibilities in particular are the, the crisis of the strike in Britain in 1926, and shortly thereafter, um, the eruption of the Chinese Revolution, 1927-28. So his charge against the Stalinists in this period are that they're squandering these revolutionary possibilities. They're squandering an actual revolutionary situation, at least potentially, in Britain and then in China. The charge in 1933 is going to be a little different, as we'll see. The charge in 1933 is that the Stalinists make an ultra-left sectarian mistake of not aligning themselves in an authentic united front with the Social Democrats and maybe even others like liberals to stop the Nazis from taking power. Right. In other words, um, the charge there was that this, it was the Stalinists who had the ultra-left position vis-a-vis -vis the Nazis and vis-a-vis -vis specifically aligning the potential uh, united front action with the Social Democrats that could have stopped the, the Nazis from taking power. So this raises the question of Trotskyism as sectarianism, where I started off. In other words, how are we to regard uh, the charge of Trotskyism as sectarianism? It goes back to the 1920s, meaning the, the charge of kind of ultra-leftism and sectarianism really goes back um, to the 1920s. In the 1930s, it's a little bit more complicated because what, what Trotsky and the Trotskyists have, what the incipient Fourth International has, is the opposition to the Popular Front policy by what they claim to be is the authentic United Front policy of, articulated in the early Third International, in the first four Congresses of the, of the Third International. All right, so the idea is that Trotsky represents in the 1930s, continuity with the perspective of the early Third International. He's also making that claim in the 1920s, but the situation, both objectively and subjectively, in other words, with respect to the actual politics of the Third International, right, the idea is rather that the Third International is making rightist errors in this period. In other words, is playing it too cautiously, too conservatively. Now this is why, for example, um, it would have been very difficult, in fact, for Trotsky and the left opposition to have made common cause with the right opposition, with Bukharin, in the 1920s against the Stalinist center. The idea, and it's really a retrospective idea, uh, it's a retrospective idea that comes um, much later, really after Trotsky's death, the idea is that there could have been a democratic opposition to the bureaucratic center of Stalin and the sort of mainstream of the Communist Party, the mainstream of the Third International. Um, that the Third International, as well as the Russian Communist Party, could have been democratized in such a way, not only so as to prevent um, the rise of Stalin as this malignant authoritarian figure, but also the claim might be made that the political role of the Third International might have been different if it hadn't been so bureaucratized. Right, in other words, if the Third International, both in the 1920s and leading into the 1930s, could have played a 
objectively, more revolutionary political role than it was able to do. Right, so there's the two sets of questions um, that are superimposed in regarding the question of the emergence of Trotskyism in the 1920s. One is the question of the objective situation. In other words, what were the revolutionary possibilities in the 1920s? Were there any? The other is the subjective, meaning in what way is Trotsky arguing against the degeneration, the degradation of the consciousness of the politics of the Third International? Already in the lessons of October in 1924, Trotsky's making the point that consciousness of the significance of the October Revolution is being lost. Right? In other words, that there's a subjective loss. He certainly isn't arguing at that time that the Third International is objectively counter-revolutionary. He's not. He's rather arguing that something of the consciousness that was essential for the October Revolution is being lost is being lost in terms of continuity within the Russian Communist Party, but is also being lost in the sense of the failure to generalize it in the Third International. Now, the significance of this is that starting with Lenin's death in 1924, there's an attempt to Bolshevize the Third International. In other words, to make the Third International more Bolshevik, to make it more Leninist. In other words, um, to carry on in the spirit of Lenin um, internationally and domestically. So domestically in the Soviet Union, what happens starting after Lenin's death is that the membership of the Russian Communist Party has increased through what are called the Lenin levies, so sort of mass recruitment into the party, um, which is handled in such a way so as to provide sort of shock troops for the Stalinist center against the left opposition. In other words, um, Trotsky has you know, serious misgivings about these Lenin levies, as well as the claim to Bolshevizing the Third International. Right? So there's a transformation of both the Russian Communist Party in the 1920s and of the Third International in this period. Right. And both of those transformations are going on under the rubric of Leninism over the claim um, to uh, make the Third International more Bolshevik and to uh, consolidate the Leninism of the Russian Communist Party. On both of those fronts, both domestically and internationally, both in Russia and outside of Russia, Trotsky is disputing this claim. He's saying, no, this is the liquidation of Bolshevism. This is actually the liquidation of Leninism. That's already happening in the 1920s. In other words, the claim is not only made in the 1930s that Stalinism is not really Leninist, is not really Bolshevik, but already that claim is being made in the 1920s. Right, that this is not, that the Third International is not really pursuing a Bolshevik policy, is not really revolutionary objectively even though subjectively it's claiming to be in the tradition of Lenin. All right, so this relationship between the subjective and the objective is what we have to keep in mind. Now, in what way, then, could uh, Trotsky make this claim? In what way is this the case? In this respect, what I mentioned earlier becomes important again. Namely, is there any revolutionary continuity international? after 1919, because 1919 is not only the defeat of the German Revolution, it's also the defeat of the Hungarian Soviet, it's the defeat of the Workers' Council movement in Italy. Right. And so, essentially after 1919, what's been demonstrated is the absence of adequate revolutionary leadership internationally. Then the question is, how does that leadership get built? In other words, in what way does one build that revolutionary leadership internationally? That's where Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder comes into play. Because in fact, the point of Lenin's argument is that the Russian Communist Party, the Bolshevik Party, had a particular experience going back to 1903 
of developing itself as a revolutionary force that's lacking in other countries. It's lacking in other countries and can't be corrected for simply by empty claims to be revolutionary. That's the, the claim that he's making against the infantile disorder of the left communists. That they're claiming to be revolutionary, but in fact they're not. Right? That's why it can be called an infantile disorder. That's why it's quote unquote left wing communism. Right? Because Lenin is disputing the fact that it represents an actual revolutionary politics, you know, in practice, that it represents the actual possibility of revolutionary politics. And is instead uh, what Marx said about uh, some of his followers uh, late in life, revolutionary phrase mongering, right? revolutionary phrase mongering. So in 1923, in this period from 1923 to 33, there's a complex of issues that have to be uh, sort of borne in mind. Trotsky thinks that there's a failure on the part of the Third International to build, to develop authentic revolutionary leadership in this period. And that that could have been done through these revolutionary crises. In other words, he's not simply saying, well, there could have been a revolution in Britain or the Chinese Revolution could have succeeded. But rather, a situation is developing where even the lessons of defeat, the lessons of failure, are impossible because of the lack of a proper revolutionary politics in these crises. In other words, whether or not these crises could have been brought to some satisfactory resolution, whether there could have been a revolution in Britain in 1926 or a, or a successful socialist revolution in China in 1927 and 28. Right? That's not the issue so much as there's a lack of for Trotsky, lack of an adequate political context through which these historical crises could be used to develop authentic revolutionary leadership. And not only in these countries, but in the Third International as a whole. Because the Third International is considered one party. It's one party of world revolution. And the Third International as a world party of revolution is failing to um, internalize the lessons of defeat and the lessons of failure. That's already the case, by the way, with the various late crises in terms of the German situation. Right? So 1923, right? the point of writing the lessons of October for Trotsky is to say, we seem to be lacking the necessary conditions for learning from this defeat. All right, so even though it's being posed as learning from the success of the October Revolution, the context for it is, are we even able to learn from defeat? Um, just a side note on this. So one of the ways in which people might distinguish Lenin and Luxembourg is that Lenin was successful and Luxembourg failed. Right? But one of the ways in which people might flip that around and say Luxembourg is better than Lenin, is that Luxembourg has an explicit perspective in 1919, in Order Reigns in Berlin, her last article, of learning through defeat, advancing through defeat. Right? This is not something unique to Luxembourg, though. In other words, this is actually not a good way of distinguishing um, Luxembourg from Lenin, or Luxembourg from Lenin and Trotsky. Rather, Lenin and Trotsky also have the perspective of the need to learn through defeat. That's their perspective on 1905, right? Their perspective on 1905 is that 1905 might have been a failed revolution, but it nonetheless was a dress rehearsal for and paved the way for the success of 1917, all right? So the defeats, all right, the question is, what's the significance of these defeats and how to learn from these defeats? Trotsky and international left opposition more generally, their attitude in the 1920s is that the Third International is losing the ability to learn from defeats. It's failing to learn from the defeat of 1923 in Germany and failing to learn from the defeats in Britain in 1926 and in China in 1927-28. So how does one learn from defeat? Right. This is the question. 
for Luxembourg in 1919, there was no question of the Spartacus Bund saying the situation is not ripe for revolution. Revolution is not possible objectively, so we should not try to make the revolution. No, her perspective is we will pursue a revolutionary politics whether or not it ultimately succeeds because it's only in the pursuit of a revolutionary politics that one can actually learn from defeat. In other words, if one a priori says revolution is not possible, it actually uh, defeats the ability to learn from failure and defeat. That's what's emerging in the Third International in this period. In other words, the idea of a second period, period of international stabilization in 1923, <coughs> all the way up to the economic crisis, the crash of 1928-29, the attitude is, well, revolution is not possible, and so therefore we should not attempt revolutionary politics. And for Trotsky, that means that even these impossible crises in terms of a revolutionary situation can't really be properly internalized. In other words, that the historical lessons can't actually be accumulated without a revolutionary politics. That's the claim um, with respect to this period. So what you'll find is that Trotsky is disputing in his writings on Britain, his writings on China, he's disputing the self-understanding of the communists, the self-understanding of the Third International. Right? He's disputing them at the level of uh, the subjective. He's not disputing them at the level of the objective so much as on the subjective. Right? What we could say is he's disputing their relationship of the objective and the subjective. Um, why is this significant? Well, with the failure of the, with the definitive failure of the revolutionary crisis period in Germany in 1923, at least from the perspective of all these figures, Stalin draws the conclusion there's not going to be a revolution in Germany. The Germans are incapable of making a revolution. It's that estimation that causes him to say we have to pursue socialism in one country. Right. For Trotsky, this means it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, to decide a priori, well, the Germans have shown in this period from 1918 to 1923 an inability to make a revolution. Therefore, revolution in Germany is not possible for the foreseeable future. Therefore, we have to pursue the development of socialism in one country. That becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. What you'll find is that um, Trotsky is criticizing, critiquing the Stalinists at the level of their self-understanding in the 1920s in terms of their policy being a self-fulfilling prophecy, meaning the, the uh, policy that they pursue, the strategy that they pursue becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of the impossibility of revolution. That's what distinguishes this period, the period up to 1928, from the latter period, which I want to address quickly. Um, so the period from 1928 to 1933 um, has a different character to it, slightly different character to it. But what we have to think about is what they might have in common, what the period from 1923 to 28 and from 28 to 33 might have in common. The third period is a period in which the claim is made that now objectively, whereas in the second period objectively, revolution was not on the agenda from 1923 to 28, now because of the Great Depression, because of the stock market crash, right, now objectively revolutionary politics is possible. That's the claim by the Third International. Because revolutionary politics is possible in this period, there's no need to make common cause with the Social Democrats against the fascists in Germany. Right? The danger would be to concede to the Social Democrats anything, because the Social Democrats are seen as the counter-revolutionary force. Right? So because the objective situation has changed, 
it therefore becomes impermissible to make common cause with the social democrats against the fascists. Also, because objectively it's a revolutionary situation, the actual danger of the Nazis is downplayed. In other words, even a Nazi victory in this period is seen as a prelude to revolution. In other words, after Hitler, us, that attitude. The reason for that is because objectively, right, the attitude is, well, even if the fascists come to power, even if the Nazis come to power, objectively they won't be able to stabilize the situation because of the economic crisis. And therefore, they'll be swept aside quickly. That's why it's after them, us. Right? Stalinist self-understanding in the third period is that if the fascists come to power, it will only deepen the revolutionary situation. Because objectively, the Nazis won't be able to solve the problem of the economic crisis. Right? That's where this judgment of after them, us comes from. Right? Um, whereas the Social Democrats are seen as a more subjective threat to the possibility of revolution, because we'll blunt the revolutionary politics, it will blunt the revolutionary situation, it will um, diffuse it in some way, the way the Social Democrats did in 1918-1919. Right. So after 1928, the idea is that this is an objectively revolutionary situation, as World War I was. Right. And the Social Democrats can then play the role that they played at that time, which is to blunt the revolutionary situation, to mislead the workers, and therefore lead the counter-revolution. The Nazis are seen as less of a threat because of the estimation of the objective situation. In other words, the idea is that the Nazis won't be able to consolidate power, that only the Social Democrats could do that, and therefore they're the greater threat. And that's why no common cause should be made with them. So, why does Trotsky differ? Why does Trotsky differ? Well, part of Trotsky's estimation in the period after 1928 is subjective rather than objective. In other words, yes, there is an economic crisis. Yes, the post-World War I stabilization of the 20s, the roaring 20s, right? the post-war boom and stabilization of global capitalism in the 1920s. Yes, objectively that's over with the stock market crash and the, the Great Depression. However, subjectively, subjectively, there is still, in Trotsky's estimation, not adequate revolutionary leadership. And the opportunities for developing inadequate revolutionary leadership were already squandered in the preceding period, were already squandered through the British crisis, through the Chinese revolution, etc. Right. So Trotsky's estimation is rather that revolutionary leadership still stands in need of being developed. Right. So common cause with the Social Democrats against the Nazis in this period, between 1928 and 1933, would have made it possible for the communists to have won over more of the working class, and not only won over to their perspective, but actually developed their own organization and their own strategy and their own perspective, such as to actually develop revolutionary leadership in Germany. In other words, the United Front policy is not only a kind of stopgap or rearguard action to keep the Nazis from coming to power, but it's actually a way for the communists to assert actual leadership and develop itself as a revolutionary force. The third period Stalinism, the sectarianism of refusing common cause with the Social Democrats, Trotsky criticizes for failing to adequately engage and develop the possibility of a working class revolutionary leadership which would not just come from out of the ranks of the communists, the already existing communist party, but would have to also come from the broader layers of the working class, namely workers who in that period are still supporting the social democrats. All right, so the point of the United Front policy 
is in fact to develop the possibility of revolutionary leadership, right? which Trotsky already thinks is lacking in the preceding period, in the period from 1923 to 28. In other words, the Third International has already botched the development of adequate revolutionary leadership up to this time, and therefore will continue to do so without adequately meeting the situation and correcting themselves, not only objectively with respect to the actual policies that they take, but also subjectively. In other words, already in this period, there's a deterioration of Leninism. Right? Um, and that's what's entering into Trotsky's estimations. Right? In other words, these are missed opportunities, not simply for revolution. In other words, again, what I said earlier, was revolution possible in Britain? Was it possible? in China, right? Was socialist revolution possible in these various crises? Perhaps, perhaps not, but at the very least, these were opportunities to develop the Third International as a revolutionary force. After 1933, that will no longer be Trotsky's project. In other words, his project will no longer be to develop the Third International as an authentically revolutionary force but rather to split the Third International. And that's what the Fourth International Project is about. It's about creating new leadership. So uh, one of the readings that I mentioned earlier that we had for today, to build communist parties in an international anew from the writings on, on Germany is really central with respect to this. Uh, the catchphrase there is entire generations thrown into discard. Right? Entire generations thrown into discard. So in other words, the entire generation of communists right, that had developed after the October Revolution through the 1920s into the 1930s, Trotsky's perspective after 1933 is that for the most part this generation is lost. It will have to be a new generation. precisely because that generation failed to develop itself through the 1920s. So there's a you know, perhaps tricky way that Trotsky is trying to navigate this history of the 1920s with respect to the possibility of developing an authentically revolutionary leadership internationally. His criticisms of the Third International in this period are criticisms of the failure to do that a failure which accumulates and ultimately proves fatal with respect to 1933 and the Nazi seizure of power, the victory of Nazism in Germany. Right, that's when he thinks, okay, the Third International was dying, was on its deathbed, was comatose, right? definitively died in 1933, but was already sick and dying throughout the 1920s. Okay, uh, hopefully that connects us uh, adequately and sets us up uh, sufficiently for um, Richard's return next week when he'll be discussing 1933 to 1940. Um, now I guess I can take some questions on this period, um, just points of clarification both here in Chicago and via text, via the live stream text. And we have that up here, um, so uh, we'll be able to um, respond to questions um, if those in New York and elsewhere would like to offer any. Houston. Um, at one point in the um, in the writings on, on China, he talks about like a person named Loman Nazda or something like that as one of like Stalin's um, new young prodigies. Mm -hmm. So like when he's critiquing policies of the international um, in China, um, does, is he also thinking of new recruits in Russia that he could be training? Because he, he seems to be thinking that like Stalin has these people, but. That's so right. Like, so um, the, in the 1920s, the question is this. There's the generation that made the revolution, 
but then there are you know younger people who are joining the movement um, throughout the 1920s. So I mentioned the Lenin Levies, right? So the Lenin Levies is young. Repeat the question. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll repeat the question for those who are not here in Chicago. The question is the struggle over the youth in the Third International. In other words, um, does Trotsky have a perspective of developing new cadre uh, towards revolutionary politics? And I said, yes, definitely, if that's the case. In other words, the Lenin levies in the 1920s, well, they're twofold. In part, they're the recruit, recruiting of the bureaucracy to the Communist Party. But also, they're the recruiting of young people to the Communist Party, including young functionaries. Right? So there's um, the existing bureaucracy, but there's also the developing of, a, of the bureaucracy in the Soviet Union through young people joining it. Um, and precisely, that's where the legacy of Lenin is being botched or failed in this period. So indeed, right, there's a struggle for um, you know, the heart and soul of the youth in the communist movement in the 1920s. And in that respect, right, there's not only a failure to extend and transmit the lessons of the October Revolution or the lessons of the revolutionary period 1917 to 1923, but also there's a failure internationally to provide the possibility for the experience of these uh, crises of the 1920s, whether in Britain or in China. Right? So it's not only a failure of the existing cadre to apply the lessons of the past, but there's also a failure to even allow the young people who are participating in these crises to learn anything from them. Right? to be developed as um, revolutionaries at all. Now, I want to mention, therefore, that the issue of 1905 is important in this respect. Right? 1905 was a crisis year for Russian social democracy. Right? They recruit a lot of people. Um, both the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks recruit a lot of people in 1905. And then in the aftermath, in 1906-07, with the reaction, they also lose a lot of people. But they also lose some people, uh, the Bolsheviks lose some people in terms of um, a kind of ultra-left opposition to Lenin, who consider the situation to still be revolutionary, whereas Lenin decides, no, it's not revolutionary. Um, and those are people who had been Bolsheviks before 1905, for the most part. So when Lenin gives his account of how the Bolsheviks trained and developed and became steeled in left-wing communism and infantile disorder, what he's talking about is, okay, how did the young people who joined the Bolshevik party in the 1905 revolution come out of that experience and train themselves to become the leadership of the October Revolution in 1917? Right. It's in that respect that the 1905 revolution is the dress rehearsal for 1917, because there's actually a new layer of younger people in the Bolshevik party um, whose experience of the 1905 revolution proves critical, at least Lenin thought, in the possibility of making a revolution in 1917, or in realizing revolution in 1917, facilitating revolution in 1917. Now, for Trotsky, that means that the generation that was recruited, the generation of the Third International that was recruited in the period 1917 to 1923, why he writes the lessons of October, right? That they're failing to learn the lessons of that time such that they could be the revolutionary leadership of a future crisis. That failure is continuing through the British crisis and the Chinese crisis, 1926, 1927, 1928. Right, in 1933, the issue is a little bit different uh, with the Nazi seizure of power because basically it's the, uh, it's not a temporary setback, it's more of a catastrophic defeat of the Third International and of the, the German party in particular. <coughs> um, but 
The idea is that there are young people joining the Third International throughout the 1920s, but they're not being given the proper experience to actually be developed as an, as an actual revolutionary political force. Okay, let's see. Maybe you should read it aloud for the recording. Okay, so um, Platypus New York City is giving us uh, some questions. It seems that you think that Trotsky might have overestimated the revolutionary opportunities of the mid-1920s, but that this is not essential. What is, is his claim that they were missed. Opportunities for the development of the Third International, or excuse me, that there were missed opportunities for the development of the Third International. Can you specify a little bit more what those would have been in Britain and China? Part two, part of the significance of 1933 has always been in I don't know whose view this is, the display of centrism. If Stalinism was not optimistic enough about the prospects of world revolution, they were not pessimistic enough to anticipate how barbaric bourgeois society could get. Thoughts? Oh, this is Jeremy's question. Um, right. I would say that, uh, no, the criticism, Trotsky's criticism of Stalinism in 1933 is not that it's centrist that it's reformist, that it's counter-revolutionary. This is the point that I was making in my lecture. In fact, um, we need to clear through a lot of um, sort of Isaac Deutscherism and also bad Trotskyism as well as Stalinism, right? This histor historiography uh, has been botched in a variety of ways. We have to pay close attention to Trotsky in this period. His criticism of Stalinism in 1933 is actually different from his criticism in the 1920s. So his criticism in the 1920s was that they were centrist. His criticism in 1933 is that they're reformist and counter-revolutionary. Right. Um, which is different. Now, with respect to optimism and pessimism, this is one of the reasons why Deutscher doesn't help us. Um, because this is not something that can be adjudicated properly at the level of optimism and pessimism. Right, in other words, it's not that Trotsky is more optimistic and Stalin is more pessimistic. It's actually not going to be adequately dealt with that way. Um, that there's a more fine-grained matter, and that's why I brought up the issue of subjective and objective. Right, a dialectic of the subjective and the objective. Right. We could accuse Stalin of having you know, too pessimistic a view, but that wouldn't be sufficient. In other words, to say, oh, well, Stalin's declaration of socialism in one country is his pessimism about world revolution. No, what it is is a judgment of the subjective and the objective, meaning not only is the world situation stabilizing after 1923, but also in Stalin's view, the German communists are not revolutionary. Right? So it's not simply a matter of optimism, pessimism, but it's a judgment of the objective situation and the subjective situation. Meaning, Stalin is taking a cynical view of the German Communist Party. He's not only taking a view, a pessimistic view of the objective situation, but he's also taking a pessimistic view, if we were to put it that way, or a cynical view about the German Communists. In other words, it's an estimation of both subjective and objective factors. And it's also an estimation of the relation of those factors. Now, this can't be adjudicated properly in terms of, well, Stalin should have been more optimistic about the subjective. He should have been more optimistic about the German communists. That's why it's not optimism and pessimism, because in fact, Trotsky might have agreed with Stalin. In fact, <coughs> most likely he would have, that the German <coughs> Communist Party was incapable of making a revolution, subjectively, that the subjective factor was missing. Right? But nothing necessarily flows from that. Rather, how does one articulate the subjective and the objective? Right? That's where um, it becomes a question of the party, right? in the Lessons of October. That's why he says that the party question is really crucial. Right? Because you know, even beyond the question of optimism and pessimism, then, there's the question of the objective and the subjective. Well, what is the party? Is the party a subjective factor or is it an objective factor? Well, in fact, it's both. It's both subjective and objective. All right, there's a dialectic of the objective and the subjective here. Let me see what we, um, what we have. New question from Lisa. Uh, 
Last week in the Chicago discussion, I spoke about how Trotsky saw that in 1917, a split in the Bolshevik party, Lenin versus everyone else, was a precondition for revolution. The Mensheviks were focused on objective conditions, and Lenin on the subjective conditions, on acting. Can this be compared to the 1920s? Um, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Um, indeed, the revolutionary crisis of World War I and the situation in the aftermath of World War I was clearly deeper, a deeper crisis, and therefore more of a revolutionary situation than 1926 in Great Britain and 1927-28 in China. How can one say that? Well, in fact, this is where the whole category of secondary national radicals comes to bear. In other words, it's actually a factor for Lenin and the Bolsheviks in 1917 that Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht exist in Germany. Right? Um, and also that they might have followers. In other words, that there's a strike wave in 1920, in 1916 in Germany. Um, there are dissidents in the SPD, and there's a split with the USPD right, in 1916. Luxembourg and Liebknecht taking part in that split, being part of the USPD against the SPD in 1916. So again, part of Lenin's estimation in his April theses is that there is potentially revolutionary leadership in Germany, and therefore revolution in Russia is possible. Right? So again, what we have to avoid is saying, well, split in the Russian Communist Party. No, what had happened was there was a split in, in, in international social democracy starting in 1914. And that that split continued to play out in 1916, in 1917, in 1918, in 1919. Right? Potentially revolutionary leadership existed, not only in the form of these figures, although these figures proved to be extremely important, but also with respect to the potential following that they would have, or more accurately, um, the potential working class revolutionary sentiment that such figures as Luxembourg and Liebknecht could facilitate their playing a political role in making a revolution. All right, so it's very tricky. Right? The 1920s uh, already bear the effects of failure and defeat. Unfortunately, right again, the way the Stalinists dealt with this was, well, the only real revolutionary leadership is the Bolshevik party, meaning the Russians, and therefore we have to Bolshevize that they're international. Whereas Lenin in 1920 had explicitly said, look, the Bolshevik party can serve as something of a model, but actually can't just serve as a model for the third international more generally. In other words, we have to learn the lessons of Bolshevism, but that doesn't mean simply applying Bolshevism to the third international so the estimation in the 1920s was, well, only the Russian Communist Party is really uh, you know, embodying the revolutionary tradition, and the rest of the Third International has to be Bolshevized. Right? So there's an attempt to Bolshevize the other parties in the Third International. Right? That's not Lenin's attitude in 1920. Right? And again, for Trotsky, the question is, well, what does that even mean? Right? What does Bolshevization mean? He's in dispute over that. You went into, like, <clears throat> at the beginning, you, you started talking about Trotsky and, and his legacy being one of splits, but um, like, how, how do we contextualize this in the period you're talking about? Because uh, you said, I didn't see like, sort of the connection between that and what you actually discussed. You seem to be defending him from that, but. Um, well, of course, in the 1920s, um, there isn't a question of a split. Mm -hmm. 
meaning it's an international left opposition within the Third International. It's a left opposition within the Russian Communist Party. But really, it's an international left opposition within the Third International that we're talking about. And so, in that respect, um, there isn't a split. Is that a problem? Or? Uh, how, do we, how, do we how do we adjudicate that? Yeah. I don't know. You know, um, because there were left splits from the Third International in this period. Karl Korsch, for example, is a left split from the Third International in this period. Right? There is, um, you know, there are other organizations outside of the Third International that consider themselves to be to the left of the Third International. Trotsky doesn't take that step until after the Nazi seizure of power. So there's a whole spectrum of positions out there. Right? The question is, why should we privilege Trotsky? above the others. Why shouldn't we look at um, you know, left oppositionists uh, outside of the Third International in places like Germany, um, or for that matter, Britain, right? There were the left communists that, um, that Lenin was polemicizing against in left-wing communism. Why should we pay attention to Trotsky and not to the others, right? Do we therefore necessarily share Trotsky's perspective, if we privilege Trotsky, that the Third International could be reformed in the 1920s. It's one of the reasons why I know I brought it up last week, um, and it's also something that Richard and I talked about also with Spencer between last week and this week. Why say that the revolutionary period is 1917 to 1919 and not from 1917 to 1923? Right? Why have that? Um, estimation. Precisely because um, it comes down to a question of uh, was the Third International a stillborn project or not? Right? Trotsky did not consider the Third International to be a stillborn project, but rather a viable project. A viable project that was botched in the 1920s, but still a viable project. We have to put a question mark over that, I think, in retrospect. What that means is taking Trotsky seriously, but not sharing his perspective 100%. And so we have a kind of complicated task before us with respect to the consideration of Trotsky and Trotskyism. First of all, we have to separate Trotsky from bad understandings by Trotskyists, including Isaac Deutscher, who wasn't a Trotskyist, but who opposed Trotsky from the right. But Deutscher's perspective has come to stand in for Trotskyism, even though it wasn't actually Trotskyist. There's that. Um, but then also, you know, those who would be critical of a Deutscher perspective also share in some of these problems the degree to which they would date the revolutionary crisis to 1923 instead of to 1919. In other words, there's still the question of, okay, what's the relationship between um, subsequent Trotskyism and the first four congress congresses of the Third International. It's why when Mike McNair spoke at our Legacy of Trotskyism panel at the 2011 convention, it's why he said to be a Trotskyist means to agree with these things. Right? It's to agree with the transitional program. It's to agree with the writings of the international left opposition of the 20s and 30s. It's to agree with the first four congresses of the Third International. Right. In other words, Trotskyism is not you know, some ambiguous thing, but it's ra rather codified. And that even if you were to bracket the whole question of post-Trotsky Trotskyism, you'd have to take seriously what Trotsky himself said. And that Trotsky's own perspective is based on the first four congresses of the international, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that I, for one, might agree with Mike McNair about is that um, Trotskyism might be wrong to assume the perspective of the early Third International. In other words, that the early Third International might not actually serve all that well. In the readings for today, uh, Trotsky does talk about the United Front policy. And what he says is that the United Front policy wasn't concocted out of thin air, wasn't sort of imagined by the Third International, but was actually imposed upon the Third International by the course of events in the revolutionary period from 1917 to 1923. In other words, he, his understanding of the United Front policy, and the United Front policy specifically as it was being botched by the Third International, the idea was that, well, in fact, the Third International adopted the United Front policy with reason, 
In other words, it didn't just come up with the strategy ab uh, abstractly, but the United Front policy came out of the historical experience from 1917 to 1923, right? So uh, one of the ways in which he talks about this, I think he, he mentions that um, the period from 1917 to 1918, the coalition government with the Bolsheviks and the left social revolutionaries, right, could be considered the democratic revolution period of the Russian Revolution, right, because we talked about this last time a bit, of how the Stalinist view then shifts things so that the February Revolution in 1917 becomes the Democratic Revolution and the Socialist Revolution starts in um, October of 1917. In fact, what Trotsky says is no, uh, the Democratic Revolution, and this, he agrees with Lenin on this, it's the Democratic Revolution that begins only in October of 1917. And then that phase of the democratic revolution actually perhaps ends with uh, the leaving of the left SRs from the revolutionary government, which shortly thereafter is the outbreak of the German revolution, in fact. In other words, spring of 1918, the left SRs split with the Bolsheviks. Fall of 1918, the German revolution erupts. Right? And so, again, it's not simply a matter of what's going on in Russia, but also globally. Right? That the democratic revolution in Russia ends around the, and the socialist revolution, the task of socialism presents itself in Russia, precisely when the world revolution, the revolution outside of Russia begins in 1918. Right? But there are all sorts of judgments and estimations that are built into that kind of a narrative. That again, we can't necessarily just take for granted, but we have to sort of, you know, actually analyze, take it apart. Okay, so we have more questions. We have questions from Platypus Boston, and I think that, um, and we have a question here from Gabe. But let's do the Platypus Boston questions, and then we'll actually have to end the transmission because we started a little bit late. But we should be en ending the transmission soon and take a break. Boston, question from Divya. How is the transformation in Trotsky's estimation of the Stalinists from the 1920s to the 30s, centrism to reformism, related to the corresponding transformation in the objective conditions for revolution? In other words, could you relate this to the ebb and resurgence of revolutionary possibility? Question number two, I'll just lay out there. Why is the question of democracy, rightists and third international leftists versus bureaucracy, Stalinism in the 1920s, a retrospective question? Well, okay, let's deal with the first question first. Um, the transformation in Trotsky's estimation of Stalinism from centrism to reformism. Well, how is it related to the corresponding transformation in the objective conditions? Okay, well, this is, uh, this is you know, again, uh, the tricky part. The idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The idea that um, the Stalinists not only fail to respond to the historical situation, but actually contribute to the historical situation, contribute to the historical development, right? So the idea is that um, the idea is one of orderly retreat. If we look at Lenin's characterizations in Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder or Notes of a Publicist, 1922, right? So Lenin's formulations are that we're retreating, but that we are not, you know, falling off the mountainside. Right, right. Because he's, he's got the um, uh, the metaphor of the the rock climber, mm -hmm. right? Saying that you know we're we're going back down. We we found that going up this way won't lead us to the top. So we're retracing our steps. We're going back down in order to be able to restart the <coughs> climb. Right, but we're not falling off the mountain. Right, we're retreating, but we're retreating in such a way so that we could begin to climb again, right? That's an extremely important metaphor, right? Maybe one that Trotsky himself didn't take too much to heart, or not enough. Namely, that maybe the way we were trying to climb 
doesn't lead to socialism. So we have to retrace our steps and try a different route. Right. What that means is that it's not simply a matter of recapitulating the experience of the October Revolution, nor of you know, the policies of war communism, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Nor the third international policies of that early period of 1919, 1920. Right? Perhaps a different route is going to have to be taken to achieve socialism. So the question is, again, this Bolshevization, a kind of reification of the Bolshevik experience that took place in the 1920s, that happening makes it impossible to separate out what the objective circumstances were versus the subjective circumstances. In other words, because the subjective situation was being liquidated through Bolshevization and Leninism in the 1920s, it actually becomes, in retrospect, very difficult to gauge what were the objective possibilities in the 1920s? We don't know because they weren't subjectively engaged properly. Right? This is the whole point of regression. Like the whole point of the regression thesis is that it's actually a deep question. In other words, it's not possible for us to say, well, objectively, it was revolutionary, and then they just botched it subjectively. No, there's a dialectic. And for Trotsky, again, it's not, well, the Stalinists adopted the wrong policy in Britain and in China, and therefore they missed a chance at revolution. Rather, they missed a chance at articulating the subjective and the objective. In other words, they missed an opportunity to engage that historical situation. Right? And therefore, learn anything, but also develop anything objectively, practically. Learn anything theoretically, but also develop anything practically out of that experience. OK, now the second question. Um, the question of democracy, the rightists, and uh, democracy versus bureaucracy. OK, so the question of a democratic opposition versus the bureaucratic center. Right? Now, the fact that it poses itself that way is itself a symptom. Right? In other words, the right opposition, the idea of the right opposition is that capitalism needs to be developed in Russia. Right. Um, in other words, uh, <clears throat> there's the enrich yourselves uh, perspective t with respect to the peasantry that Bukharin has in Russia. Um, the international right opposition generally sees it as a situation of, um, again, that revolution isn't really possible in this period, that all that's possible in, is the defense of democracy against fascism. That's the right opposition. The left opposition, their perspective is different. The left opposition, of course, is that um, there are still revolutionary possibilities. Or, more specifically, there's still the possibilities for developing a revolutionary politics, even in the period of reaction, stabilization, ebbing. Right? That's still the task of developing a revolutionary party, right? internationally, the third international, that still that task remains. Right? So it would have been impossible for Trotsky and the left opposition to have made common cause with the right opposition because they saw their tasks as being different. In other words, they not only saw the objective situation differently because they may not have even seen the, the, the objective situation so very differently. Rather, they regarded the political tasks as being different. So if you regard the political tasks as different, how can you collaborate with, them, with, with others? Right. So it's a retrospective question because then later people say, well, what if, right? Because again, the idea was that Stalin was a centrist, not that he was an authoritarian reactionary, right? But rather he was a centrist. And therefore, right, um, in some ways you'd want to not overcome Stalinism from the right, but rather from the left. Right. 
So you wouldn't want to make common cause with the right opposition because that would mean potentially undermining the center and leading to capitalist restoration in Russia and the liquidation of the Third International. Right, so you know, it's a retrospective question. Um, it's also kind of an academic question, meaning it wasn't really possible. It wasn't possible subjectively. Right? In the self-understanding of the right opposition and the left opposition, it would have been impossible to make common cause against them. Rather, what, what was at issue was who was going to win over the center. In other words, the right opposition was trying to win over the Stalinist center to their pers perspective, and the left opposition was trying to win over the Stalinist center to their perspective. Not winning over Stalin, but willing, winning over Stalin's followers. Right? That was the political strategy, the political task of the left opposition was to win over the center, and for the right opposition was to win over the center. It wasn't to make common cause with the others against the center. So that's, that's why. Um, let's, uh, Gabe, you had a question? Well, yeah. I mean, and that'll be the last one. I think. So it seems like the the main takeaway, main point is, or one main point is to certain like not to reduce Stalinism to authoritarianism. Right? Yes. And, and not to sort of reduce Trotsky's critique of Stalinism. There. And that's, you know, in reading the, the readings, of course, one gets that, but then one also gets sort of the sense that, you know, the in a way, it's, it's hard to not read, like it feels like reading these readings that Trotsky is sort of speaking to the air. So that like, all, he's like going through these like, he's, he takes the critique of the Stalinists seriously up, you know, and, and it's like goes through them point by point by point and kind of exposes how absurd their points are. And, and so, you know, that coupled with the squ squelching of internal debate within um, the Third International in general. The Third International in general, it, it sort of becomes hard to like, it's like, it, <clears throat> certainly one wants to have a deeper critique than just authoritarianism, but at the same time, it becomes, it, it's hard to, let me just read this. Um, you know, if Stalin estimates the international revolution is improbable, which is sort of the, one of the things you're saying, it, it's hard to even think that he would estimate it as desirable. You know, what were the possibilities of the 20s? Can we say they were inadequate? Or can we just say that you know they were partially? It seems like Trotsky's point is they were inadequate because Stalinism itself was profoundly reactionary in, in the way that it's squelching the possibilities itself. And so, like, in other words, the way that I put it for, for, for Trotsky, like Hitler comes to power because of Stalin. Very, you know. Right. The way that I put it is that if we read Trotsky's not because Trotsky's, of a failure of leadership within Germany only. No, in the Third International. That's right. No, if we read these writings by Trotsky, we have to read them in context. And again, the context is not just an objective context of what was the world situation, but it's rather the subjective context of what was the broader self-understanding of the Third International. Because what Trotsky has tried to do is emulate Trotsky's style. In other words, they try to write the way Trotsky wrote about Britain in 1926, or the way he wrote about um, China in 1927-28, people try to emulate this style in the present, but without any context. In other words, we read Trotsky as speaking to the air now, right. because we read it in the present. And in the present, that, that can only be speaking to the air. Right? He was not speaking to the air. He was speaking to the Third International. He was speaking <coughs> to millions of cadre throughout the world, right, who he thought could read his criticism and recognize its, its substance, its content, with respect to the practical situation. Not the objective situation, the practical situation. In other words, that it's a practical critique. It's not a theoretical critique, right? Now, reconstructing that context, though, is very tricky. And I think that, um, again, we have to be careful not to decontextualize or abstract, right, or theoretically reify Trotsky's articulations. In other words, these are not, uh, you know, they're, they're engaged political writings right, from a specific moment, and a specific moment not only of objective circumstances, but of practical politics. 
right? And so there are polemics, and you know, he makes accusations, and you know, they are calibrated in his mind to find a hearing. Now they didn't find a hearing. They didn't find a hearing. What that means is that we can't but suspect that Trotskyism was always sectarian hopelessness. Right? In other words, you know, it's a big question mark. What, why didn't people listen to Trotsky? Certainly, he thought that they could have listened to him, and he wrote in such a way as to reach people, but it didn't reach people, right? Um, or if it reached people, in other words, Trotskyism only really becomes a mass movement much later, after Trotsky's death. And again, the style is sort of adopted, right? and is influential starting in the 60s, but really in the 70s and later. And so today, like a large portion of the left internationally is Trotskyist. It finds a hearing out of context and therefore has a fundamentally different meaning. Right? It's why we're doing a series on Trotsky and Trotskyism. What is the relationship between Trotsky and Trotskyism? In other words, what's the, what's the significance of pe people trying to be like Trotsky? Right? right? It might be that the significance of Trotskyism is hopeless sectarianism, precisely because we don't share that historical moment. But, I mean, you know, Trotsky's self-conception at this point is, you know, Stalinism is bound to defeat itself, is bound to usher its own defeat, and when that happens, I will, you know, the, the new, the fourth international will um, sort of play the leadership role, play the role of the leader. Which didn't and, happen. And, and, right, right, it didn't. But one can say that, like, after the fact, after the total defeat of the collapse of the USSR, in a way, like, the, the reason that Trotskyism is popular is because, for a related reason, and sort of, like, disjointed but related reason, we can look back and see Trotsky as a heroic fi figure. You know. and it's that's, it's and treacherous. We, we can look back and yeah. see Trotsky as sort of the one with clean hands. Ah, uh, right. right. And I think that that's related to why Trotsky. But we shouldn't Trotsky be cons we should Yeah, we popular. shouldn't be concerned with Trotsky having clean hands. In other words, uh, that shouldn't be a concern because that already concedes the point that somehow we're in the realm of ethics, not politics. Yeah, I mean, I would say for, this for sure. But, but that, I'm saying that that's related to the, you know, what you were just talking about, which is why Trotskyism today is sort of the largest of the. Right, this is something that we'll come back to in the later meetings. In other words, this is definitely something for the later meetings. It's really for starting next week with the Fourth International, and then after Trotsky's death, we'll have two meetings. And that question will really be the substance of those meetings, not, not yet today. All right, so we'll break now and resume um, for local discussions. Thanks, everybody.